Praise the Lord. I welcome you to a Saturday workers' training tonight. And I pray that this session will be an eye-opening session for every one of us. That even though we're looking at a familiar passage, all that God wants to reveal to you and to me, the Lord will reveal without any blockage in Jesus' name. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and bless your name. We know that your mighty God is self-revealing God. And we're praying, Lord, that you reveal yourself in a clear way to everyone, in a plain way to everyone, that, Lord, everything we need to know as your child, as your servant, as a worker, and as a shepherd in the household of faith, you reveal to every one of us in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Today we are looking at John chapter 1 and verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. It's talking about Jesus, as you know. And it's talking about Jesus as the Lamb of God. Look at your Bible. It says, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There's a lot in that verse. Actually, the first mention of the Lamb is when Abraham was told to sacrifice his own son. And then the son asked him and said, My father, here is wood, here is fire, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, The Lord will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And so when the lamb first appeared, it was a substitutionary lamb. As Isaac lay there to be slain, to die, then Abraham saw the lamb, and the Lord said, Lay not your hand upon the child. And he took that lamb that became a substitution for Isaac. And it is telling us that when eventually the lamb of God will come, it will be a substitutionary lamb. The next time we see the lamb is in Exodus chapter 12. And you remember, every family will take a lamb for each house. And it will sleep. They shed the blood. And then they'll put the blood on the lintels of the houses. And God said, when I see that blood, I will know that if someone had died, a lamb had died for the people there. It was a symbolic lamb. To symbolize that when Christ comes, this is what he will do. His blood will cleanse. His blood will save. His blood will protect us from the judgment to come. And then we come to Isaiah chapter 53. And he's still talking about the lamb. But the lamb now is a sinless lamb. It's a spotless lamb. As you look at the lamb that John the Baptist said, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him. And he says, he says to the people, here is the one we have been expecting, the substitutionary lamb. Here is the one everybody needs, the symbolic lamb. Here is the one everybody needs to connect to. He says, behold the lamb the sinless lamb and the spotless lamb. And he was this lamb, is the lamb of God, set apart. He said, I sanctified myself, that she also may be sanctified. I set apart myself. Are you following what the Lord is revealing to us about the lamb of God? Is the set apart, is the sacrifice, is the sanctified lamb. 
and then he was going to die for us on the cross of Calvary. And that is how he will take our sins away. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And it is that that makes him the sacrificial lamb. It is the sin-bearing lamb. He bears our sins. He takes our sins away. And then that's not the end. You know that he died on the cross of Calvary. And then he rose on the third day. And he appeared to his own disciples 40 days with infallible proof that this is the reason Christ is gone to heaven now and he'll be coming back and when he comes back he's going to reign, he's going to have a dominion, he's going to have a kingdom that will last forever and ever and he'll be the supreme lamb. Think about that. The substitutionary lamb, think about it. The symbolic lamb, think about it. He is a sinless lamb. Think about it. He is a spotless lamb. Think about it. He is a sanctified, set apart lamb. Think about it. He is a sacrificial lamb. Think about that. And he was smitten, the smitten lamb. He was slain, the slain lamb. But then eventually when he reigns forever and ever, he is going to be the supreme lamb. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're looking at the lamb tonight. And I want to talk to you on the central place of the Lamb in redemption. The central place of the Lamb in our redemption. The central place the Almighty God has given to the Lamb. The central place of the Lamb in redemption. There are three things we're looking at. Very simple. Number one, behold the Passover Lamb. Behold the the Passover lamb. Number two, believe the priestly lamb. Believe the priestly lamb. Everything the priest did for the children of Israel in the Old Testament, Christ has now done for us. And But we need to believe. We we'll behold, that's number one. We we'll believe, that's number two. We we'll believe the priestly lamb. But then, now he has died. Now he has shed his blood. Now I'm saved. Now you are saved. We're not just saved. We're also servants of God. And we are ready to take the message of the Lamb, the gospel of the Lamb, the good news of the Lamb, and the sacrifice of the Lamb to take that to all the world. Number three now, beam the prevailing lamb. Beam it. Beam it forth. The message of the lamb. Show it forth. The message of the lamb. Bless it abroad. The message of the lamb. Beam the prevailing lamb. Or blaze abroad the prevailing lamb. We're coming to point number one. And it's in uh, John chapter 1 verse 29 again. Behold the lamb. Behold the Passover lamb. It says the next day John see Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away when you behold him. When you see him, when you connect with him, when you reach out to him, and when he has a saving effect, a sanctifying effect in your life, he taketh away the sin of the whole world, the sacrifice of Jesus. What Christ did on the cross of Calvary is enough. There's no other sacrifice. It's enough. There's no other suffering. It is enough to take away all the sin of the world. If he's able to take the sin of the world away, think about this now, he's able to take the sin of the whole nation away. He's able to take the sin of the whole family away. He's able to take the sin of the individual your own sins is able to take everything away. And when he takes them away, he separates you from sin. And he separates sin from you. He takes away. He removes from you. You know the meaning of that? He cleanses you. You know the meaning of that? He forgives you. You know the meaning of that? He takes the effect and the punishment of sin away from you. As we look at the lives of human beings who are polluted by sin, 
We're defiled by sin. We're made dirty by sin. We, we make ourselves unclean by our sin. Number one, it takes the pollution of your sin away. It takes away the sin of the world. Number two, it takes the punishment of sin away. It cried on the cross of Calvary, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was bearing your sin. He is the sin bearer. He had no sin of his own. Sinless, spotless, sanctified, pure, perfect. He had no sin of his own. But because he took your sin on him, that's why the Father forsook him, which taketh the sin away the sin of the world. That means then he bears your sin. He bears the sin of every member of your family. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Tell every member of your family, the, your nuclear family, your immediate family, your extended family, everyone. Let each one know that Christ has come and is the Lamb of God and he has taken away the sin of the world. He takes away the sin of every tribe. The sin of every state in our country and the sin of every community in every country and the sin of every country is take everything away. We do not need to continue in the pollution of sin. We do not need to continue under the weight and the load of the punishment of sin. It takes the presence of sin away. The presence of sin. It takes that away. It takes away the power of sin, so that sin will not have dominion over you, over me, over any of us anymore. Look at verse 36 of John, of John chapter 1. In verse 36, still saying the same thing and looking upon Jesus as he watched, John could not take his eyes away from Christ, away from Jesus. He said, that is the one. And then he says again, behold the Lamb of God. God. Behold, the Lamb of God, actually, this had been in prophecy. And as you look at Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 21, you'll see the program of the Lord. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21, you'll see the plan of the Lord. Exodus chapter, chapter 12, verse 21, it says that Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And kill the Passover. Passover, a lamb for the Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I'm sure you believe that. I'm sure you understand the feeling of your sin cannot remain. The guilt of your sin cannot remain. The condemnation of your sin cannot remain. Everything, every blame, you blame yourself. But you know, look to the Lamb. Don't look at your feeling. Look to the Lamb. Don't look at your condemnation. Look to the Lamb and see what the Lamb has done. And he said, draw out and take you a Lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it says, and you shall take a bunch of his soap and dip it in the blood that is in the blood of that lamb that has just been slain, that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. That's the blood of the lamb. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. That is, you come under the shelter of the blood. You come under the security of the blood. And you stay there, you abide there. Look at verse 23. It says in verse 23, that for the Lord will pass through the, uh, to smite the Egyptians, the people who are not under the blood, the Gentiles who are not under the blood, the people that stay outside the mark of the blood, it says, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer, will not allow, will not permit the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Judgment will not smite you anymore because of the smiting lamb 
and the calamity will not come upon you anymore because of the lamb that have been slain for you and smitten for you and sacrificed for you. The New Testament makes an application of this and tells us what the lamb has done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 7 here. It says, Porch out therefore the old leaven. The leaven there is a symbol of sin. It's a symbol of evil. It's a symbol of transgression. It's a symbol of the, of the iniquity of human beings. It says, Porch that out. What's that saying? It says, Repent. It's going to take your sin away. If he has not done it yet, it says, Surrender that and give that to him. If he's going to take something from you, you must be willing to give it up. You must be willing to surrender that and say, I give this, I surrender it unto you. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, look at this, even Christ, even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Is sacrifice for us. It's for me. I said it's for me. Thank God it's for you as well. It's sacrifice for you. It's for your wife. Let her know so she can get saved. It's for your husband. Let him know so that he can get saved. It's for your children. Let them know so that the judgment of God will not be upon them. It's for your neighbors. Let them know. Let them know. That's why we're workers. That's why we're servants of God. That's why we're preachers of the gospel. We have tasted of the goodness of God. And he has taken our sins away. Now, we need to inform other people that even Christ, their Passover, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8 there. As you look at verse 8 of that same chapter 5, he says, Therefore, because the sacrifice for us, therefore, because the sinless one has died for you. Because the spotless one has died for you. Because the sacrificial lamb has died for you already. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. Our thoughts are now new. We're not thinking of a future judgment anymore because he has taken judgment away from us. We're not thinking of punishment anymore because he has uh, taken punishment away from us. Uh, I've said something very important there. You know, there are people, if there is a little thing that is happening uh, and, uh, you know, a little pain, a little problem, they should take authority over and say, get thee behind me, suffering uh, of Satan. They'll say, maybe I'm suffering for the sins I committed in the past. When he has taken your sins away, he has taken the punishment away as well. All the old thoughts, take that away. All the old feeling, reject that. All the old understanding, reject that. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Of sincerity and truth. Look at First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. First Peter chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 18. It says, For as much as she know, you must know this. You must know that you know beyond any shadow of doubt. For as much as she know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but how then are we saved if we're not saved by silver and gold? If we're not saved by paying the pastor's deal? If we're not saved by giving money? If we're not saved by the works of our hands? If we're not saved by corruptible material things? How then are we saved? If we're not saved by keeping the tradition of the elders, how are we saved? Look at verse 19. This is beautiful. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. That's our salvation. That's the source of our salvation. With the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's exactly what the Lord has been helping us to emphasize that we are saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You remember what uh, we've learned that behold the Lamb of God we take us away the sin of the world. I want to emphasize those words take us away, take us away. I want you to picture now sin like a tree, like a tree. And you have branches, and you have fruits, and you have those outward things, and then you have the root of that tree. It falls to fall, cuts down that evil tree. That uh, tree has seen, and all the branches, all the works of the flesh, everything forgiven, everything cleared up, everything removed, but the stump is still there. But the roots are still there. And if uh, that is not taken away, that tree will revive again and will come up again. And the branches will come up again. You know what he has done? He has taken the branches of that tree away. And now he has taken the very root of that tree away. He takes away the sin of the world. He takes away our sins. He forgives us. He sets us free. And he cleanses us, he washes us in the precious blood of the Lamb. We're forgiven, we're saved. Now, the root is also taken away and we're sanctified. It takes the very root of sin away from us. And praise the Lord, it's available. Praise the Lord, it is real. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 14. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us, that's the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who gave himself as the substitutionary Lamb. He gave himself as the sacrificial Lamb. He gave himself as the, as the sin-bearing Lamb. He gave himself as the supreme Lamb. And the Lamb of God that is able to take all the seeds away, the branches as well as the roots, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us, he might redeem us from all iniquity. From all iniquity. Can I ask you a question? I want you to answer me. From how many iniquities will he redeem you from? That's right, that's right. All iniquity. And look at this. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. A peculiar people, zealous of good works. In First John chapter 3, reading from verse 5. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 5. Here is uh, what we know now about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is like a summary of everything. And you know, you must know. By experience, you must know. There is mental knowledge. That's not enough. Experiential knowledge that you know this, that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Doesn't that say everything that this is what we know by experience? Doesn't that say everything we've gone to him? We have connection with him. And because of that connection of faith with him, we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. How? Because as you come to him, connecting with him, it takes away your sin. And it takes away the power of sin from your life. It removes the pollution, number one. It takes away the punishment, number two. It takes away the presence of sin, number three. And it breaks the power of sin away from your life. Now you are able to live free. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. That's like saying, whosoever has gone for a wash is clean. 
and there's no dirt on him. There's no, there, there's no um, kind of uh, soil on him. But whosoever is still dirty has not gone for a wash. That's what he's saying there. Come for a wash and be washed and be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, A little children, newcomers, believers, children of God, let no man deceive you. Let no literature deceive you. Let no seminary deceive you. Let no preacher deceive you. Let no minister deceive you. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Look at uh, how it continues in verse 8. In verse 8 now it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil. How do I understand that? I'm saying that the word of God is saying uh, when you go for cleansing uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ, he cleanses you. He washes you. He looks at your heart. He cleanses that. At your soul, he cleanses that. At your mouth, the word of your mouth, he cleanses your mouth. He cleanses your lips. He cleanses you outwardly and internally. But there are people who are held by the devil. No, you will not go for cleansing. No, you will not go for cleansing. And they foolishly agree with the devil. You don't want me to go to Christ? Okay, okay, I'm yours. That's why it says they cannot have the authority over their sin because they have not gone to Christ. They allowed the devil to hold them at ransom, hold them captive, and keep them in that sin. That's why it says... He that committed sin is of the devil. If you are looking for somebody whom the devil has tied down, has pulled down, has kept down, I will not allow them to come to Christ. That's the man, that's the woman. He is not going to Christ. Therefore, he does not have power over his sin. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Tear yourself away from the devil and all the works of the devil will be destroyed in your life in Jesus' name. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All the struggling will be over. Yielding to temptation, everything will be over. Being powerless, everything will be over. Because for this purpose, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why it says in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, is gone to God, and is born of God. You understand that? When you are born of your father, of your mother, you take on the nature of your father. You take on the nature of your mother. And because you are born by that father, look at the complexion of that father, look at the child. Look at the walking of that, of that father. Look at the child. Look at the voice of that father. Look at the child. You resemble the person that gave birth to you. And because we are born of God, we resemble God. He does not sin. He does not do evil. He does not do iniquity. He does not do any unrighteousness. We are born of him. We resemble him. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. He cannot. Somebody says, I don't understand that. You were born by an Ausa man. And you lived with that Ausa man, your father. And you ate all that that father had been eating. And you speak the language that you have been hearing from your father. And then I speak Yoruba to you. You cannot speak Yoruba. Why? You were born of a father who spoke, who had been speaking Ausa language. And you live with him, and you remain with him, and all his nurture, all his training remains in you. 
You cannot speak English. You cannot speak German. You cannot speak the Dutch language. Why? Because of who gave birth to you that has been speaking to you and training you. God gave birth to you. And he does not sin. And his seed remains in you. His strength remains in you. And the Lamb of God has taken away your sin. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. What am I to do now? What are you to do now? What are we to do so that this privilege of being born of God will be ours? So that everything the Lamb of God came to do will be ours. That brings us to point number two. Believe the priestly Lamb is the Lamb of God. You behold Him. And you know, my salvation is there. Here is my Savior. Here is my substitute. Here is my sanctifier. Here is the one to manifest the nature of God in me. What's the next step? Believe that lamb. Believe the priestly lamb. Uh, let, let's look at, uh, the, at, at uh, Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 32. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. He is a man, he, the son of man, he, the son of God, he, the one that all those sacrifices of the Old Testament symbolized. The substitutionary lamb, the symbolic lamb, the stainless lamb, the sinless lamb. The spotless lamb, the smitten lamb, the slain lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the set apart, sanctified lamb, the supreme lamb. The place of the scripture where the eunuch of Ethiopia was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb, like a lamb, dumb before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. And then he said, I don't understand. Of whom is this one speaking? Of himself, the prophet, or is speaking of another man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, it says, And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And preached unto him Jesus. That's the word I heard. I became saved. That's the word you heard. You became saved. Do what Philip has done. Open your mouth. Tell your neighbor. Tell your friends. Tell your schoolmates. Tell the people around you that this is the Lamb of God that taketh the sin of the world away. He preached unto him Jesus. And then we're told in verse 37, verse 37, it says, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, remember, was reading about the Lamb of God, and then Philip explained to him the identity of that Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, thou mayest be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe. Believe the Lamb. That's what brings salvation. Believe the Lamb. That's what brings uh, sanctification. Believe the Lamb. That's what brings freedom from judgment, the judgment to come. Look at uh, Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 38. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, the Lamb of God, through this man, Jesus, 
through this man, our Lord Jesus Christ, through this man, our Savior, who died for us, be it known unto you, brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, it says, By him all that believe, believe the Lamb, believe the Lamb, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Keeping the law of Moses, you cannot be justified. You'll miss a point. You'll miss your step. You will do something uh, unconsciously. You will do something you didn't plan to do. You cannot perfectly keep the law of Moses. You cannot perfectly keep by yourself, in your own strength, in your own power, the Old Testament laws. But now Christ justifies us. He saves us. He forgives us. He cleanses us. The moment we believe, look at that verse and underline that word, believe, believe. All that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now in verses 40 and 41, verses 40 and 41, there's something here, beware therefore. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Verse 41, Behold, ye despise us, and wonder, and perish, and wonder, and perish, and wonder, and perish. For I walk a walk in your days, a walk which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You know, I have wondered many years ago when I read that verse for the first time. And it says, Behold, ye despise us and wonder and perish. And I asked myself, how could somebody wonder, wonder? He looks at a wonder, he says what a wonder this is, and yet he perishes. And I didn't understand at that time, but now look at what the Lord is saying. We're coming to John chapter 5, verse 43. In John chapter 5, verse 43, it's talking about what Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name as the Lamb of God, appointed by God, anointed by God, introduced to the world the Lamb of God that taketh the sin of the world away. And I am come with his authority, and ye receive me not. Ye believe me not. If another shall come in his own name, underline the words, in his own name, him ye will receive him ye will believe. We need to believe the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And he's talking to the Jews and he's talking to everybody in the world that will not believe that Lamb of God. Another will come in his own name. In his own name. He will not come in the name of the Heavenly Father. He will not come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will come by his own authority. And he comes in his own name. And surprisingly, there is something he will do. That the people of the world will wonder about him. And him will ye receive. What's that talking about? It's talking about a personality that will come. Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13 verse 11. Remember now, this individual and this personality will come in his own name. And John the Beloved said, And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. Two horns like a lamb. This is something to wonder at. This is something the people of the world will wonder at. But they will wonder and 
perish. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast. He will come. He looks like a lamb, but when he speaks out, he's speaking like a dragon. And because the people did not believe the real lamb of God, the pure lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God, this other one, looking like a lamb, will come in his own name. And he will exercise all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed because he performed some so-called miracles and healed the deadly wound, the people will wonder and they will believe this false lamb. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and he doeth great wonders. And he doeth great wonders. That's why the people will wonder. So that he maketh the fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. The time is coming. Those who do not receive Christ now, they will miss the rapture because they are not prepared, because they were not purged, because they were not saved, because their sins were not taken away, because they did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the real sacrificial Lamb of God. And they will remain on earth after the rapture. And then the great tribulation will come. This Antichrist will then do great wonders and they will wonder. Look at Revelation chapter 17, looking at verse 8. Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, but the world will not know, and go into perdition. The world will not know the end from the beginning. They will not know the punishment, the perdition that will come upon him, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. That's it. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder because they do not believe the wonders of Christ, the healing of Christ, the deliverance of Christ, and the, and the salvation of Christ. They said, no, we don't want to believe. And Jesus said, all right, I've come to you in my Father's name, and ye believe me not, and ye receive me not, another will come in his own name, and him will ye believe, and him will you receive, and they will wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast, instead of beholding the Lamb of God, they will behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. That looks new to you, shouldn't be, because actually all these have been prophesied from the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophesied about Christ coming, about the Lamb coming, about the Lamb that will take away the seas of the old world also prophesied about this deceptive personality who will look like a lamb, who will look gentle and look peaceful, and yet it will do things they will wonder at, and instead of giving their life and giving their heart to the lamb of God, they'll give their lives to this uh, pretending lamb that will come. Look at Daniel, just uh, one or two verses here, in Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. Daniel chapter 7 I'm reading to you here from verse 8, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up a little among them another, another. That's the another that Jesus spoke about, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. It will look like a man, gentle. 
a gentle man, an approachable man, a peaceful man, and it will be like a lamp, but it will have a mouth speaking great things. In verse 25 of that same chapter 7, verse 25, in verse 25, uh, look at what is saying here, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, even though he looks like a lamb having two horns, looks sheepish, and looks meek, and looks nice, and looks peaceable, yet he has the mouth of a dragon. And he was speaking words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Instead of strengthening the saints of God, instead of building up the saints of God, it will wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. It will think to change times and laws. Christ, the Lamb of God, when he came, he didn't change the word of God. He says, a judge, a title will not be changed of the word of God, but this other one coming, another one that will come in his own name. He says, I have all authority. He abandons the real word of God, and he will think to change the times and the laws, and they shall be given to his son. Look at this now, until a time, one, and times, that's plus two, making three, and the dividing of time. And half, half of a time, one year, two years, half a year, three and a half years. The great tribulation will be there at that time. And this one that is looking like a lamb, it will come. If you don't believe the lamb of God now, the rapture will take place. And then the saints of God will go to where Christ has gone to prepare. And then you'll be in the world at the time of the great tribulation. And you'll see a man that looks like a lamb that is gentle, that is peaceful. And then for those three and a half years, it will deceive the whole world. It will say, I don't come in the name of any God. I don't come in the name of any Christ, I come in my own authority, I come in my own power, and it will demonstrate such power for a time and times and the dividing of a time. I pray you'll not be in the world at that time. Say good amen. Amen. In chapter 8 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 24. Daniel chapter 8, reading from verse 24, is telling us, and his power shall be mighty. That's that one that will come in his own name. He'll manifest great power. That's why the world will wonder at that time. And his power shall be mighty. But not by his own power. Satan will energize him. Satan will infill him. It will be a, like an incarnation of Satan. Like um, he's coming in the fullness of the power of the evil one. But not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. He shall destroy wonderfully. And shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. The people who are still in the world, who will be in the world at that time. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, and through his policy also shall he cause craft, deception to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. He shall magnify himself in his heart. Underline what follows now. And by peace destroy many. And by peace he look like a lamb. And because the people of the world had not believed the real lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb of God, the sinless lamb of God, this one will come looking like a lamb and by peace shall destroy many and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes he'll stand up against christ the prince of princes but when he does that when he goes that far at the end of those three and a half years he shall be broken without hand he shall be broken without hand. Look at Daniel chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 21. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. It's talking about the Antichrist that will come. I pray you'll not be in the world at that time. And the only way you'll not be in the world at that time is that you believe the Lamb of God now. Let him take away your sin. 
Let him take away your guilt. Let him take away all your condemnation. Those who remain in the world after the rapture, the false lamb, the pretending lamb, and the deadly lamb, and the pernicious lamb will come and then he show his true colors. And in Daniel chapter 11 verse 21, and in his estate it shall stand up a vile person. A vile person. The true lamb of God is sinless. This one is vile. The true lamb of God is holy. This one is vile. The true lamb of God is spotless. This one is vile. The true lamb of God is supreme and is, so, is supernatural. This one is vile, a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but it shall come in peaceably, it shall come in peaceably like a lamb and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He will obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Daniel 11 verse 36. In verse 36, it tells us about his willfulness. Daniel 11 verse 36, and the king shall do according to his own will. This uh, other land that is to come, that Jesus said, I come in my father's name, and ye Jews, and ye unbelievers, and ye scoffers, receive me not, another will come. In his own name, him shall ye receive. I pray I'll not be in the world at that time. You'll not be in the world at that time. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. There we are. He comes in his own name. He says, I'm not coming in the authority of any god. I don't recognize. He doesn't recognize any god. He will come by himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous words against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. That that is determined shall be done. Why are we talking about this? Because the true, uh, the true Lamb of God is there for you today. And the Lord is saying, believe, believe. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you don't come at this time, if our friends don't come at this time, if our neighbors don't come at this time, the time will come after we are gone. After the saints have been raptured, that this other personality will come. I'll be reading the Old Testament. Let me read just one, one portion of the New Testament for you that it, it enlightens us about this in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. This is that one that looks like a lamb. Is this one that comes in his own name, another shall come in his own name. He will look like a lamb. Verse 4 says, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. You better believe this pretending lamb and this pernicious lamb and this lamb that is going to drive people into hellfire. He will come and it says he will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Praise the Lord. What the apostle told the believers at that time. We who are privileged to preach the word of God, we also need to tell you, I was telling you now, don't you remember Paul the Apostle said that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and then in verse 6, it says in verse 6, and now ye know what was holders that he might be revealed in his own time, because the church is still here, and we're not gone yet, because the church is still here, and we're not raptured yet, because the church is still here, and we're waiting for the 
the Son of God, his second coming. We're waiting for the Lion of the tribe of Judah that is coming again because we're still here now. That's why he has not been fully, completely revealed. But we're told in verse 7, in verse 7 it says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let it, who now hinders, will let, will hinder, until he be taken out of the way. When the church is taken out of the way, when the church is removed out of this place, then that pretending lamb, that pernicious lamb, then that terrible lamb will come. And then we're told in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. Shall that pretending pernicious lamp be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In verse 9, it says in verse 9, even him that uh, pretending pernicious lamp, even him uh, that antichrist, even him that power that people will wonder at in the time of the great tribulation, even him uh, who's coming. Is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. That Antichrist, when he comes, he says, Are you looking for another Christ? I can show you power, I can show you signs, and I can show you wonders, but they are lying wonders. In verse 10, it says, In verse 10, and with all deceivableness of a righteousness, in them that because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In verse 11, it says, And for this cause, for this reason, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. They didn't believe the truth. They didn't have the love for the truth. The Lamb of God that came to save us, sanctify us, and get us ready to take us to heaven. They didn't believe that. They will believe a lie. In verse 12, it says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness at pleasure in unrighteousness but the time has not fully come although the spirit of the antichrist already walking in in the world and are many antichrists even now but the real antichrist that is going to come and manifest that supernatural satanic power is going to come and i pray you'll not be here at that time in jesus name when that antichrist comes Number one, he'll be satanic. He'll be satanic. He'll be walking with the power of the devil. That's why you need to give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ now and behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Number two, he'll be subtle. He'll be subtle. He'll come like he's peaceful. He's come like he wants to help. He's come like, look at all the wonders that he can do. He will be, he will not only be satanic and he will not only be um, subtle, he will also be subverting, he will subversive. He will be subverting people, he will be changing their mind, it's okay, even if that Christ, another Christ is going to come, can he manifest more power than this other one? That's why we need to be very careful that even at this time, you might be hearing of this miracle, there, that sign, there, that wonder here, don't wonder and perish, don't wonder and perish. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the power of Christ, the sinless Christ, and the power of Christ, the spotless Christ, and the power of Christ, the sacrificial lamb will work in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. If you wait too late, and if you wait until the church is gone and the Antichrist comes, that Antichrist will be self worshipping, self worshipping. He'll say, I'm here, don't worship any other God. Here I am. 
Abraham, he will see it in the house of God, in the temple of God, and he will say, I am the one to worship. And I pray you'll not be here at that time in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. You'll not be here at that time in Jesus' name, and you'll not be waiting for that one that is satanic, and that one that is subversive, that one that is self-worshipping, that one that will impose himself upon the people, and then you'll not know, what am I going to do now? What you have to do? To save the situation and to prevent all that happening to you is that to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Do you remember the, that word of God we've quoted so many times and almost everybody knows that now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, whosoever at this time now, time of opportunity, at this time now, time when you can call upon the Lord, whosoever believeth on the Lord. Jesus Christ will not perish but have everlasting life but have everlasting life I about all the sins you have committed I about all the wrong ways of God it says fear not only believe fear not only believe fear not that judgment will come only believe fear not that you will still suffer for your sin only believe believe at this time of opportunity while he's knocking at your door and while he's saying i'll take all your sins away i'll take all the punishment of sin away i'll take the pollution of sin away i'll take the presence of sin away i'll take the power of sin away this is the time to believe if you believe he'll give you the victory we're looking at first john chapter 5 first john chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 4 in first john chapter 5 reading from verse 4 for whoso for whatsoever is born of god overcomes the world you believe of the lord jesus christ now and don't wait until that time when the antichrist will come whatsoever whosoever is born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith look at verse 5 in verse 5 who is he that overcomes the world who is he that overcomes all the temptations of the world all the pollutions of the world, all the drawing, uh, evil, iniquity of the world, all the transgressions of the world, who you see that overcometh the world, but he that believeth Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God, and he will take all your sins away. As you believe today, look at verse 18 of that same first John chapter 5, and in verse 18, it's saying in verse 18, we know. You ought to know this by experience. We know. You ought to know this by connection with Christ, by trusting in Christ, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Whosoever the Lord takes you away from sin, and he takes sin away from you. He takes you away from Satan. And he takes Satan away from you. He takes the subtle one out of you. And he takes you out of subtlety. He takes the subversion from you. And he takes you away from the subversion. And you believe completely, wholeheartedly, or reservedly on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this you will know. Like with all the saints of the children of God, you know, I know, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God, he that is begotten of God, because he believes in the Lamb of God, the real Lamb of God, he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That wicked one touches him not. As he goes about distributing error, he'll not get to you. If he gets there, you'll not accept. He goes on distributing temptation and sin. He will not touch you. You will not accept. He goes on distributing pandemic and distributing a sickness. You will not accept. And it says, and that wicked one touches him not. Let's come to point number three now. we we'll beam forth the prevailing land will blaze abroad 
the prevailing lamb. Now we know the lamb. The lamb of God. As we call him the prevailing lamb. Let me show you that in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 5. In Revelation chapter 5. Reading from verse 5. He is the prevailing lamb. And one of the elders saith unto me. Weep not. And the word of God is telling you today again. Weep not. If you know the lamb. You believe the lamb. You trust the lamb. You have faith in the lamb. And you know he's the prevailing one. Weep not. Whatever problem you have, Christ can take that away. And Christ will take that away. Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has prevailed. Is the prevailing lamb. As prevailed. Is the prevailing Lord. As prevailed. Is the prevailing lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed to open the book. And to lose the seven seals thereof. In verse 6, it says, in verse 6, it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, the living creatures, and in the midst of the elders representing the church, stood a lamb, stood a lamb, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. Having seven horns, seven is the number for perfection. And the horns is the symbol of power. Having perfect power. Having the completeness of power. Having the totality of power. And seven eyes, seven, that's perfection. Eyes, that knowledge, that's insight. Having perfect knowledge. Which are the seven spirits of God. That's the perfect spirit, the Holy Ghost, sent forth to all the earth. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And then in verse 8, in verse 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, the living creatures and the four and twenty elders representing the church, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them halves for joy, halves for singing, halves for giving glory to God, and golden veils full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And then in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, And he sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, that's the slain lamb, that's the smitten lamb, that's the sacrificial lamb, that's the Passover lamb, that was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And then in verse 10, it tells us in verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, the priestly lambs wants to make kings out of us. The royal lamb wants to make royalty out of us. He has made us unto our God and kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. If you behold the lamb today and you believe the lamb today and you beam forth and you blaze abroad the story of the lamb, the gospel of the lamb, the good news of the lamb, the message of the lamb. If you beam that forth and you blaze that abroad, on that day you will have reward. He will reward you because of what you have done for the Lord. Blaze it abroad. Blaze it abroad. Let's look at that in Mark chapter 1 verse 45. Mark chapter 1 Reading from verse 45, you'll see what the leper did after the leper was cleansed. And you will see what the believer ought to do after the believer now has believed the Lamb. And he has taken all the virtues of the Lamb and his life is totally renewed. It says, but he went out and began to publish it much. Or the line that word, publish it much, publish it much. That is the story of the prevailing Lamb. The story of the perfect lamb and the story of the poaching, cleansing lamb. He blazed that abroad and to blaze abroad the matter is so much that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without. 
in the desert places and they came and they came and they came unto him from every quarter. Oh, what does the Lord want, you, want us to do at this time? Behold the Lamb. Believe the Lamb. Blaze abroad the story of the Lamb. The redemption of the Lamb. The power of the Lamb. And the, and the scene, the commission, the great commission of the Lamb. Publish it much. Blaze it abroad. I want you to understand. You are bringing those two words together. Publish it. Beam it. You are bringing those two words together. Publish it and blaze it abroad. It tells us in Psalm 68 verse 11. Psalm 68 verse 11. This is what the Lord is telling us. And he's telling us about what we need to do. About your responsibility. About my responsibility. It says the Lord gave the word. The Lord has given us the word already. The word of redemption. The Lord has given us the word already. And it's the word of salvation. The Lord has given us the word already. And the Lord gave the word. It's the good news. It's the news that will save people. And the Lord has given us the word. Look at the lamb. The lamb that died for the sins of the whole world. The Lord gave the word great was the company of those that published it. They beamed it forth. They blazed it abroad. They told everybody, that's your chance now. That's your responsibility now. That's your calling now. That what the Lord himself has given us, we publish that and we blaze that abroad. Actually, that's what the Lord wants everyone to do. Uh, you are high, you can do it. You are low, you can do it. It's very interesting and very instructive. As we look at Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Jonah had gone to Nineveh. And he had declared the word. And he went through the city declaring the word. And the king heard of that. Look at verse 6. Jonah chapter 3 verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him. And he covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And then in verse 7, the glorious thing that he did, the good thing that he did, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published, the king, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published, highly placed, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published, a man of authority over the whole of the city. And he caused it to be proclaimed and pro published through Nineveh by the decree of the king. And his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, but let, let them not feed nor drink water. And then in verse 8, it says what they are to do, how they are to call upon the Lord. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Can you think of the king? Can you think of a highly placed man? Can you think of a royal man? Can you think of a queen? Can you think of such a high person of authority? Publish him, beaming it forth, and telling people, let them cry mightily unto God, ye. Let them turn everyone from his evil way. He published the word of repentance. And then he said, and from the violence that is in their hand, the Lord saw that. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, the Lord reversed the judgment and God saw their walls that they turned from their evil way because a king published that. And because a man of authority published that, blessed it abroad and told everybody and every household heard. Every household in Nineveh. That's what you have to do now. Believe the Lamb Behold the Lamb and beam forth and blaze abroad the story and the gospel and the good news and the redemption of the prevailing Lamb. And God saw their words and that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he, that he had said he would do unto them and did it not. And did it not. Are we still to do that today? 
Are we to still publicize that today? Are we to still blaze abroad the gospel and the story of redemption today? Yes, we are to do that in Mark chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. Mark chapter 13. We're looking at what Jesus Christ has said, that the gospel, this gospel, must be published among all nations. It's now your responsibility. It's now my responsibility. It's now our responsibility altogether that this gospel of the kingdom must first be published among all nations. And then in verse 11, it says, And when, uh, when, they, shall, and when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate. Don't say, how will I say it? What will I do? It will come spontaneously. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. Ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost in you. We'll do it. You will do it. We'll do it together. Behold the Lamb. Believe the Lamb. Blaze abroad. Beam forth the story of the Lamb. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. This is what, how they responded. And this is how they did it. And this is how you are also to do it. You're not just say, okay, I believed the Lamb. You can do more. Behold the Lamb. You can do more. You can blaze abroad and you can beam forth the story of the Lamb, the gospel of the Lamb, the redemption of the Lamb. And they went forth. And they went forth, all the people. Actually, these are the members because the apostles remained in Jerusalem. But now, the children of God, now the members of the church, everyone who has beheld the Lamb, everyone who has believed the Lamb, everyone who has benefited from the sacrifice of the Lamb, they went forth and preached everywhere. They went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word or signs following. There's an amen there waiting for you to shout out, Amen. You will go forth and you will do it. And you will speak the word and you beam it forth and you blaze it abroad and you will publish it. Today, we have learned about the central place of the Lamb in redemption. The redemption of humanity. The redemption of everyone, yours, mine, and the redemption of people around us. And praise the Lord, we behold the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Praise the Lord, we believe the Lamb, the priestly Lamb. And we will not believe the pretending lamb, the Antichrist, will not allow the spirit of the Antichrist to influence us in any way. We're holding on and we're seeing and we're believing and we're concentrating on the priestly lamb who has taken our sins away. Believe the priestly lamb and now beam it forth, the story, the gospel, the message. The redemption of the Lord, beam it forth and blaze it abroad. And many people will come to Christ through you. And great will be your reward on that final day in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up now and commit what we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Let, let's stand up and tell the Lord, Lord, I thank you for the revelation of your word. I behold the Lamb. And as you behold the Lamb and look at Him, you are changed from glory to glory. As you behold the Lamb, all the guilt of your sin will drop off. And all the power of sin will drop away from you. As you behold the Lamb, the, the Lamb that comes to save, that comes to deliver. As you behold the Lamb, you will discover that all those uh, shackles of sin, everything will drop off. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb is a sinless one. 
is the spotless one, is the sacrificial lamb, is the substitutionary lamb, is the one that has taken your sins away. Behold the substitution of the lamb. Behold the sacrifice of the lamb. Behold the sanctification through the lamb. And it becomes yours. Believe. Believe the lamb. It cleanses, it washes, it purges, it prepares us for glory, it prepares us for eternity. Believe the Lamb and now make up your mind, make up your mind and blaze it abroad. Make up your mind, I will be made forth. Make up your mind, I will publish it. I will be among the people that wait forth. I'll be among the people that are going forth and are preaching everywhere and that are preaching by all means in every way, by all, in all possible ways. I'll use this tool and use that other tool and use that other tool and beam it forth and transmit it on and get the gospel to everyone. And as we do that, you do that, I do that, we all do that, and we beam forth the word of the gospel everywhere the Lord will walk with you and the Lord will confirm the world with signs following. Confirm it in your own life, confirm it in your own family, confirm it to the people you are preaching to, confirm it to everyone and great will be the multitude that will come to the kingdom and they will praise God and they will sing the praises of God on that final day when the Lord shall gather all of us together. Be part of this. Behold, believe, be made forth. Behold, believe, bless it abroad. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word we've had again. Thank you for this tool you put in the hands of every worker. Thank you, Lord, for this word that you have used to encourage us, enlighten us, and to send us forth. We're asking, Lord, that as we behold the Lamb, the power of sin will be broken from every life in Jesus' name. As we believe the Lamb, the benefits of Calvary and the benefits of the Lamb of God will be for every one of us in a practical, definite, experiential way in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we have the opportunity to beam it forth, to bless it abroad, many will come to know the Lord in a very definite experience of salvation. And as we follow up on them and disciple them, we pray they will be strengthened, they will be stabilized, they will become steadfast, sanctified in Jesus' name. I pray that your power and your spirit will be upon all your people and the passion to blaze it abroad and the passion to preach this word and the passion to blaze it and beam it forth. You grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We will not be tired. We will not be weary. We will not be backward. We will not be discouraged. We will not relent in our efforts as we go forth preaching the gospel, telling the story of redemption. Your work with your people and your power will follow everyone. Signs and wonders, pure signs, pure wonders and delivering wonders and the saving wonders, healing wonders will follow every one of us. There will be miracles everywhere as we proclaim the word of Christ, the word of power and the word of authority it will go forth with anointing. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. We praise the Lord and we thank God for the opportunity he has given us. Make sure of the opportunity. Behold, believe, bless it abroad. God bless you.